We now welcome George Friedman, New York Times bestselling author and geopolitical forecaster. His newest book, Flashpoints. I'm holding the book up for you. The emerging crisis in Europe warns of not of, of hot spots where tensions have erupted throughout history and where he thinks conflict is due to emerge again. He joins me from New York. Thanks for being with us, George. What do you see as uh, What's the most important thing on your mind right now overlooking this whole crisis in Europe? What worries you the most? Well, what worries me the most is Germany. Germany exports 50% of its GDP. It's got this huge economy, it's addicted to exports, and it's overwhelming Europe. If it causes Europe to fragment, Germany's economy is going to go south. And when Germany's economy goes south, that's the fourth largest economy in the world. So I'm really worried about this crisis breaking the foundation of Germany. Why did you call the book Flashpoints? Because in the history of Europe, there have been areas that have always been flashpoints for war. The Ukraine is one. Uh, the uh, Turkish border is one. The Mediterranean is another, the English Channel. What I'm saying is that nationalism is returning to Europe. And as nationalism returns to Europe, these flashpoints will become active again. We've already seen it in Ukraine. The jihadist attacks in France and the like, where is that going? Well, I mean, that's not going to take down any governments. It's just a danger. But what it's going to do is cause European governments to try to get control of their borders. Uh, they want to know who's coming in, who's going out. They don't like the Shenzhen business. And when they stop the Islamists from moving in, they're also going to stop Bulgarian workers from getting a chance to go to, uh, let's say, Belgium and get jobs. We're in the process of seeing the borders close down, and the attacks by the Islamists just helped that along. The former head of U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, Michael Flynn, likens the fight against Islamic militants to the Cold War and suggests the world should create a single, unified, and international chain of command, probably civilian-led, to meet the challenge. What do you think of that? Well, that's a nice dream, but I don't think the Russians are going to put their troops under American command, and I don't think Americans are going to put their troops under Brazilian command. Uh, the idea of a single, integrated group implies that everybody has the same view of the Islamists. They may be close, but they're not identical. And they certainly don't represent the kind of threat that the Soviet Union represented. Look, we have to keep it in perspective. The Islamists represent a danger. They don't represent an existential danger to the survival of countries. Uh, you can't compare it to the Cold War. You've said that the single most important event in 2014 is one that didn't occur, that Europe did not solve its outstanding economic, political, and social problems. Why do you see that as so important? Europe is the wealthiest region in the world. Europe is, has a larger GDP than the United States. If Europe destabilizes, the entire world is going to be affected at its core in a way that nothing else, including Islamic terrorism, can do. And the fact is, it's been six years since 2008. The American economy has grown by 5%. European economy is flat, and unemployment in Southern Europe is between 20 and 25 percent, as high as it was in the Great Depression in the United States. So we're looking at one of the important regions of the world, not just destabilizing, but really going in opposite directions. Germany going one way, the rest of Europe going another way. Uh, you know, you remember World War I, you remember World War II. This is how nasty things start. Don't, not saying we're going to a world war. I'm just saying that we are seeing some very unpleasant processes underway. This is a very important book. And in the book, you state that expectations upon which the European Union were founded were unreasonable. And you describe the Union as crumbling. Do you believe it can mm -hmm. survive? I don't think it can survive in its present form. Uh, you know, when you have one part of Europe with 25 percent unemployment, one part of Europe with 5 percent unemployment, there's no single policy that can solve this problem. And I don't think Southern Europe is going to be able to pay off its debts no matter what. So the real question here is not whether the euro survives, it's whether the free trade zone survives. That was the beginning of the European Union. That is the heart of the pre-European Union. And I don't see how 
a free zone, trade zone, with one country, the fourth largest economy, exporting 50% of its uh, economy to the rest of uh, the region, how that can survive. Imagine if the U.S. exported 50% of its economy, of its GDP, a good part of it to uh, Canada, a good part of it to Mexico. How could that union survive? There's an irrationality in the European Union, and I don't think it's manageable. If the right wing rises in Europe, and we might see a trend toward fascism, do you see the, any thoughts of a World War III? I don't, I don't believe there'll be a World War III on the order of anything we've seen before. But look, we're already seeing a confrontation between the United States, Europe on the one side, and the Russians on the other side. I mean, it's not as if Europe has ha not had significant wars. 100,000 people died in Yugoslavia uh, in the 1990s, while Euro the rest of Europe was quiet. Europe, historically, is a violent place. Over the past 20 years, it's been relatively quiet uh, on its own, but it has not been completely quiet, and now we're seeing those strains reemerge again. We talk about flashpoints. Well, there is no greater flashpoint than the one between Europe and Russia and Ukraine. And what about Russia in all of this in 2015? Do they, they're having economic problems of their own. What happens there? Well, remember, Russia's always had economic problems, and they've been able to defeat the Wehrmacht, Napoleon. The Russians don't respond to economic problems the way Americans do. It doesn't define how they behave or, in fact, when they get into economic problems, they become more aggressive. And so, Certainly, Russia has economic problems. I was recently visiting there, and what it's basically told us, look, we've always had economic problems. It's good times that are rare. So the good times are ending, but we're not going to give up our national interest over that. In an interview right about this time last year, you said the United States is clearly going to be the leading economic power 25 years down the road. Do you share that view now? Yeah, absolutely. Last quarter, the American economy year-on-year year grew by 5 percent. At the same time, the Chinese are declining in their growth rate ra radically, and the Europeans are not growing at all. Much of it is, is declining. So it's very clear to me that the United States, because it doesn't export huge amounts of money, of goods, U.S. exports only about 9 percent of its GDP compared to 50 percent for the Germans. That means that it doesn't really depend on the rest of the world. And now that it has relative economic, um, energy independence, um, it seems to me that the United States is even stronger than I thought it would be. In a commentary you wrote shortly after the uh, elections two years ago, you described Barack Obama's presidency as ending in a state of failure. Have you changed your mind a little on that? Well, what I mean by failure is that the president no longer has the support of Congress, relatively little support in the country, and can't really get anything done. Uh, Bush's presidency ended in the same condition. Right now, Obama's is too. He's trying to handle that by passing um, administrative laws. Those are getting challenged by Congress, maybe challenged in the courts. You really are, in the last two years of an eight-year presidency, unless you're an Eisenhower or a Reagan, you are stuck. You are not able to continue to function as you did before. Everybody's planning for the new uh, president. George, thanks so much. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. George Friedman, the Thank book you. is Flashpoints, The Emerging Crisis in Europe.